I would like to create a presentation on formative assessment and what it looks like in an online education environment. So in this presentation, I will talk about what formative assessment is. I will give you an overview of the theory and key characteristics of formative assessment. I will briefly introduce you to some web technologies that can be used to conduct formative assessment in an online classroom. The largest part of this will look at formative assessment examples in an online environment. So the first thing that I want to talk about is what is formative assessment? So a very brief definition is formative assessments are in the process of learning assessments. These are small and flexible assessments. And I think the easiest way to think about it is with the example of cooking. So as you prepare to have a dinner party, as you're cooking, you are likely to periodically taste what you're cooking to make sure it has enough salt and spices and see how it's going as it progresses. The tasting of the cooking in the kitchen is formative assessment, whereas sitting down with the plates and silverware in the dining room with your friends is the summative assessment once you start to actually eat the food. I prefer the term formative assessment, but it's important to talk about some other names that are commonly used for the same thing. Probably the most common terminology for this is classroom assessment techniques, or CATS, and also it can be known as assessment for learning. So let's go over some of the key characteristics of formative assessment. One of the major ones is that formative assessment happens in an environment of active learning. Sometimes I say that formative assessment is active learning with a point. You are asking students to do something, and in the process of doing what it is you ask them to do, they are giving you an idea of what they're capable of doing and what they're thinking. Their thinking can often be invisible, and these activities can make their thinking and knowledge visible in order for you to give them feedback so that they can improve. Also, these active learning activities allow you to adjust your teaching in order to best beat their needs. So another important part of formative assessment and these active learning activities are moratoriums. And this is a term that James Paul Gee talks about in his discussions of game-based learning. And he uses that term to describe in video games how there's often a place for a player to practice new skills in an environment where they're not being threatened by fireballs and monsters. And so while your classroom is unlikely to have fireballs and monsters, it is important to give students a safe place to practice new skills and get feedback and be able to process that feedback so that they can learn through failure. In these activities, they are actually encouraged to fail and learn through failure, and that does not affect their grade. Another key characteristic is scaffolding. So at the beginning of a class or in introductory classes, often you will ask students to do something like create an APA style citation. And when you ask them to do that in Psychology 110, you provide them with a lot of feedback and a lot of help through peer work and through exercises. But as students progress in the psychology curriculum, for example, all of those help systems slowly and systematically are removed so that students are expected to perform higher and higher level skills more and more independently. One of the outcomes of formative assessment is that students often are motivated to keep going when they're getting feedback, when they see that what they're doing matters and that they are making progress then they are motivated to keep going and persevere. It's also motivating for them to know that they are on the right track through that feedback. And along with motivation, students can become discouraged when they feel like they are taking too many tests and quizzes and assessment activities. But formative assessment activities are simply learning activities from their perspective. And so you can assess their learning when they don't realize they are being assessed. And the last key characteristic is feedback. And I put a number of stars after this because feedback is absolutely crucial. As I've gone over these characteristics, you'll notice that I keep saying you can give them feedback. 
In an online environment, one of the advantages to online learning is that you can have the computer give feedback to save you from grading, or you can give personalized feedback on skills that cannot be graded by a computer. But feedback is key to formative assessment. The point of these active learning activities is for you to some way adjust your teaching or provide them feedback so they can adjust what they are doing in order for them to get on the right track and progress in their learning without them getting into bad habits and having those become ingrained. So it's important to point out very quickly that formative assessments can assess different aspects of learning. So in addition to the cognitive aspect of learning, so what they're learning, what they know, what they're able to do, there is also the affective aspect of learning. So if things are going poorly in a class or if students don't seem engaged, you could conduct a quick assessment to ask them why are they not engaged? What emotions or what affective aspects of learning are preventing them from progressing in the class or being engaged in the class? And additionally, there is a behavioral aspect of learning. So you could conduct a short assessment that asks them what they're doing. For example, if many students do poorly on a test, you could do an assessment that asks them how did they study? How did they prepare? And then you could possibly address study skills if you see a trend in the class that is worth addressing. So that is a whirlwind tour of the theory and main aspects of formative assessment. The purpose of this presentation is to give you information in as short of a time as possible, but we have some really good resources that you could use to find out more. We have a physical book in the library that is a classic. It came out in 1998 called Classroom Assessment Techniques by Angelo and Cross. And in addition to providing more information on the theory of classroom assessment techniques or formative assessment, they provide information on 50 different activities that you could use as formative assessment activities in your classroom. They are not specifically looking at online learning, but I believe it would not be difficult to translate some of those into an online teaching environment. Another classic article is Inside the Black Box by Black and William. This is available in full text and you can find it through Snowden Super Search. They are looking at K-12 through education, but I found this resource invaluable and easily transferred to higher education contexts. So some technologies that you could use for formative assessment in an online environment include Google Forms. And in the settings of Google Forms, you can easily change a form into a quiz so that you can have the computer provide students with immediate feedback once they submit that quiz. In Microsoft Teams or Zoom, both of these softwares have a polling feature where you can ask students a multiple choice question and get immediate feedback from students in that classroom. Moodle provides a number of options. One is quizzes. So quizzes can be summative, but also they can be formative if you use them as a pretest or if they're not worth very many points. If quizzes are used to help you gauge student knowledge and help them gauge their own knowledge, then it becomes a formative assessment tool. Moodle also offers lessons, which can be like tutorials, and again, can give students feedback and also will collect student responses for you to easily process and address the next time you meet. And finally, discussion forums. If students are participating in discussion forums, they are giving you insight into their opinions and knowledge and feedback through those forums. There are some online softwares that could be used, like word clouds and mind mapping tools. Word clouds can be useful if students take a piece of writing, particularly reflective writing, and put it into a word cloud, and the word cloud will make the most commonly used words and phrases larger. They can share their word clouds, and you will easily be able to glance over them and see which words are appearing in large text. Also, there's mind mapping tools, and I'll talk a little bit more about mind mapping here as I give you some examples, um, but there are free mind mapping tools online, or students could use something like PowerPoint in order to create a mind map, 
and share that with you. There's also social media. You have to be aware of when students need an account, how much personal information they would be forced to share in order to participate, and also how public that platform is. Uh, but there are some uh, um, options. So for example, you could create a class blog and have students post or you could post on that blog and then students could participate either in creating their own posts or through the comment features and they may not need a an account for that and a class blog would protect any personal or social information they already had on a platform such as Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. So let's talk about some examples of what formative assessment looks like. Here are some general examples, and then I'll get into some more specific examples in a minute. So the most basic formative assessment activity would be discussion. So this could be in a live Zoom or Microsoft Teams class. As students discuss something, you get an idea of where they're at. They get feedback from classmates or from you as is appropriate. In the online class environment, you also have the option of using a Moodle forum or blog post comments as well uh, to host discussions. So as I already pointed out before, this can include polling during a live class discussion. Also, you can use a lot of techniques in order to do a trial runs of something that they'll have to do later on in the class in that those summative assessments. So for example, you can have students submit paper or project drafts for feedback. And this is something that many, many professors on campus already do. You can have students do practice quizzes or tests in order for them to test their learning. And these don't have to be for any kind of grade. They can just be for practice. And another example is if you want students to be familiar with the syllabus, you can give students a small quiz that doesn't have very many points attached to it and progress only if enough students were successful on that quiz. So some other examples include pretests. I conduct a pretest with several sections a semester of English 106 to ask them what kinds of research have they done, what do they already know about what I plan to talk about. And then when I meet with those students, I show them the results of that and only teach the things that they didn't do well on. Another example of a pretest is an inventory. When I teach my first year seminar, I want to get an idea of what vampire movies and books they already have read. And that helps guide me through the rest of the semester so that I know their familiarity with different sources as I design the class. Brainstorming and mind mapping can be a useful tool. So mind mapping allows students to make connections between different pieces of information. So the first example here is a mind map that I created in order to summarize the information I had found about brainstorming. You can do a lot with mind mapping. They don't have to be visual, but I believe that it's we should encourage students to be using space and color in order to think differently than most of the other activities we ask them to do. So mind mapping can be used to find relationships between different sources, build relationships between different things that they've learned in class, create relationships between what they already know and the new content. There's a lot of ways that you can use mind mapping and it helps make their thinking visible for you to give feedback on. It can be really useful to encourage students to brainstorm during class or as homework. So when I work with Sarah Holstein's psychology research methods students. She has students spend about an hour brainstorming what they want to research for the semester. I give them a large sheet of brown paper and some markers and they have to write down a number of ideas that could possibly work for their research project. And as they work, she walks around and gives them some feedback based on what she has seen work in the past. And she has found this to be a really good use of class time. This could easily translate into an online environment without mind mapping software or with Microsoft PowerPoint. And then students could share and get feedback on what would work with their project. 
So getting students to do course readings can be a challenge in a regular classroom and maybe more of a challenge in an online environment. I have found reading quizzes to be invaluable as a way to hold students accountable for coming to class having done the reading. So I have used this in both public speaking and in my first year seminar on vampires. These, and these quizzes are only worth 10 points apiece. So the low amount of points for any one particular quiz helps make it formative assessment. I only ask questions that should be very obvious if they did the reading. I also incorporate one or two extra credit points, which again helps make this a tool to hold them responsible as opposed to punish them for not doing well on the, these quizzes. I also grade them very easily, so if a student gives me something that doesn't really answer the question but shows that they did read what they were supposed to read, I do give them the points for this. Another example are reflection exercises. So reflection exercises may help students for a particular assignment or may help set them up for the next assignment. James Lang in his book, Small Teaching, encouraged professors to get students to make their thinking visible. And one suggestion he had for that is as they are creating their slides for a presentation, have them give you one or two slides and explain why they set up the slide the way they did. Or give the first minute or two of their presentation and get feedback on it before they finish preparing and give the presentation to the whole class. I have also used a reflective exercise in public speaking. After each speech, students have to submit a one-page typed double-spaced paper that tells me how they prepared for the speech and anything else about the background of the speech that I could not see from the speech itself. And I have seen students learn a lot from taking the time to reflect on their performance, and I have been able to adjust my teaching based on what they have said in those reflective papers. So if you want some more examples of formative assessment activities, I highly recommend the book Classroom Assessment Techniques and the 50 examples they give in there. Also, I co-authored a book with Rachel Hickoff Cresco and, and librarian Jessica Oberlin on formative assessments, specifically for librarians. And there are 48 formative assessment activities that are in this book, and these may be particularly useful if you want to do a formative assessment activity for teaching students how to do a research paper or research. So I have been studying formative assessment for quite a while, and I would be happy to talk with anybody one-on-one -on -one about what kinds of formative assessments could work for your particular goals in your class. So here's my contact information, my email and phone number, and please feel free to contact me if you would like some help talking out how to put some more formative assessment activities in your class. Thank you for watching this.